Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. My prayer and hope is that each of you are doing well as you gather to join us in our worship of God virtually this morning. And I hope that soon we will be able to join one another in person. Our first reading this morning comes from the 25th chapter of the book of Genesis, beginning with the 19th verse and proceeding through verse 34. Let us listen for the word of the Lord. These are the descendants of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Padan Aram, sister of Laban the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his prayer, and his wife Rebekah conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is to be this way, why do I live? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples born of you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other, the elder shall serve the younger. When her time came, or to give birth was at hand, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy mantle, so they named him Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand gripping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man living in tents. Esau or Isaac loved Esau because he was fond of game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking a stew, Esau came in from the field and he was famished. Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some, <clears throat> eat some of that red stuff, for I am famished. Therefore he was called Edom. Jacob said, first sell me your birthright. Esau said, I am about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Our second reading comes from the 13th chapter of the Gospel according to Matthew beginning with the first verse and proceeding through verse 23. Again, let us listen for the word of the Lord. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there while the crowd around stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen. A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Then the disciples came and asked him, Why do you speak to them in parables? He answered, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them and it has not been given. For to those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. The reason I speak to them in parables is that seeing they do not perceive, and hearing they do not listen, nor do they understand. 
with them indeed is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah that says, you will indeed listen, but never understand, and you will indeed look, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and their ears are hard of hearing, and they have shut their eyes so that they might not look with their eyes, and listen with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. Truly I tell you, Many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Hear then the parable of the sower. Anyone who hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the, snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while, and when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Open now our hearts and minds, O God, by the power and presence of your Holy Spirit, so that as your word is proclaimed this day, we may hear with joy what it is you would have us hear, that hearing we might believe, and that believing we might live lives of richer and fuller service, glorifying you here on earth as you are glorified in heaven. Amen. Someone once noted that a parable is one of those stories in the Bible that at first sounds like a pleasant yarn, but keeps something up its sleeve which suddenly pops up and knocks you flat. I think this is one reason why the scriptures are as timely today as they were centuries ago. God continues to speak to us in words that were written in a very different time and under very different circumstances. And it is my sincerest belief that the moment we ceased to be, or cease to be not flat by the word of God is the moment when we have stopped growing in our faith. To put it another way, if all that we get out of the Bible is that God hates the same people we do, we're in trouble. In a similar vein, if what we get out of the Bible is that God only loves the same people we do, then we're in trouble. If we come away from the Bible feeling that the problem with the world today is that there are not enough people like us in it, then there is a good chance that we need to go back and reread the Word of God and to ask ourselves how God is calling us to be transformed and renewed. Jesus even hints at this truth when he tells his disciples, the reason I speak to them in parables is that seeing they do not perceive, and hearing they do not listen, nor do they understand. With our minds and our senses dulled to God's word, Jesus oftentimes needs to shock us first. We have to be shaken out of our neat and tidy understandings of who God is and how God works if we are to see and understand the true nature of God. Too often, however, we are not even aware that we must be knocked flat. 
this, I think, is part of the problem behind how this morning's passage from Matthew has traditionally been interpreted in the church. We hear the parable of the sower and its later interpretation, and we are quick to rush to judgment. So-and-so must be as hard and impenetrable as the well-worn path where birds snatched up the seed because he or she has never once heeded the call of God. So-and-so must be rocky ground because they took up church membership very quickly and then just as quickly stopped being an active member in the mission and ministry of the church. Or so-and-so must be thorny ground, choked by so many conflicting demands for time and energy, that faithfulness to God just has become a low priority for them. But thank God we are the good and fertile ground. After all, we're active, we pay our tithes, we are the ones who are doing it right. Any of that sound familiar? Another variation on the same theme is to ask, or is to hear a preacher thunder from the pul pulpit, what kind of soil are you? The implication is the same. We must be good soil if we are to produce an abundant harvest. But then, all of a sudden, the Word of God in this parable pops up, and before we know it, knocks us flat. For instance, think about this. If we really consider ourselves good soil, does that mean that every moment of our lives, we strive hard to live a faithful life that glorifies God? 100% of the time? Or if we're really honest with ourselves and with our God, are there times when we are downright belligerent, hard-hearted, and stiff-necked when it comes to the Word of God, especially if God is calling us out of our comfort zones or to do something that we just don't want to do? Are there times when we respond to God's word at first with great enthusiasm, but find that enthusiasm difficult to maintain? Are there times when we get so caught up in the cares of this world that the word of God gets choked out? We couldn't say we are human if we did not answer that question honestly. So in spite of the countless sermons and applications in which the focus is on what kind of soil we are, I don't think that was Jesus' point in telling this parable. To understand his purpose, we have to put this parable in the context of Matthew's gospel. First, we should note that Matthew's gospel was written a number of decades after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And in those intervening years, the church had begun to expand beyond the bounds of Jerusalem, thanks to the Holy Spirit and the missionary efforts of the apostles. But in spite of the church's growth, Christians were still very much in the minority in terms of numbers, power, and influence. They faced opposition and persecution at the hands of political and religious leaders. This was a time when some in the church were growing more and more discouraged. And they began to question why so many people openly opposed their message of good news. These were the people to whom Matthew was writing. Little surprise then that in chapter 11 of Matthew's gospel, Jesus confronts political opposition as King Herod arrests and murders John the Baptist. In chapter 12, Jesus will encounter religious opposition as the scribes and Pharisees challenge him and even say that he is in league with the devil. 
So what Matthew has done is put in context the fact that Jesus himself has dealt with and will continue to deal with this same sort of opposition from political and religious leaders. Time and time again, Jesus encountered such resistance to his teaching and preaching. And the obvious question that pulses in the background is why? Why was Jesus opposed? Why was the church being opposed? Why were so many people resistant to the good news? Perhaps there was even a feeling beginning to grow among the faithful that their time and energy would be better spent if they didn't reach out to each and every single person they encountered, but rather to those in whom there was a higher likelihood of success. But the problem with such thinking is that we don't know ahead of time where the word of God will take root. For instance, just because a child is brought up in the faith is no guarantee that he or she will remain faithful as an adult. Just because every indication is that someone is unfertile ground, that is no guarantee that the word of God has not germinated deep within and is already taking root. And a case in point is Jacob himself. Jacob was one of the least likely figures in scripture to carry out the will of God. He was dishonest, he was deceitful, he was arrogant and self-serving, he manipulated his brother Esau out of his birthright for a bowl of stew, or as Esau so poetically put it, that red stuff. He cheated his brother out of his father's blessing. He in no way resembled what any of us would call a righteous man, and yet God chose him over Esau. God looked into Rebekah's womb and knew even as the brothers were striving against each other which one God would use to carry out God's plan. We would tend to look at Jacob and say that he was bad soil. God looked at him and said, that's my man. Somewhere along the line, we have grown obsessed with notions of success and failure. We want to be a successful church and we tend to define success with large numbers, large budgets, by how much we are respected and revered in society or how much influence and power we can exert. And for many churches, anything short of that is considered a failure. Is there any wonder why so many people get discouraged in the church? But what we too often forget was that what Jesus considered success and failure was measured in very different terms. Jesus himself would have been considered a failure. Think about it. He ended up alone, betrayed, deserted, and denied by those who were closest to him. He ended up being mocked and beaten and ultimately crucified by those who opposed him. He was a failure, plain and simple. But God redefined failure and success in the resurrection. As Paul reminded the Christians in Corinth, the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So I am inclined to agree with Barbara Brown Taylor, who asked, what if this parable is not about our own successes and our own failures, about birds and rocks and thorns, but about the extravagance of a sower? who does not seem to be phased by such concerns, who flings seed everywhere, wastes it with holy abandon, who feeds the birds, whistles at the rocks, picks his way through the thorns, and shouts hallelujah at the good soil, but regardless, just keeps sowing. 
confident that there is enough seed to go around, that there is plenty, and that when the harvest comes, it, it will fill every single barn in the neighborhood to the rafters. The focus is not on us, on our shortfalls or our successes, but rather on the generosity of our maker, the prolific sower who does not obsess about the condition of the fields, who is not stingy with the seed, but who casts it everywhere on good soil and bad, who is not cautious or judgmental or even very practical, but who seems willing to keep reaching into his bag for all eternity, covering all creation with the fertile seed of his truth. God's farming methods may seem foolish, but there is absolutely nothing wise about God's actions when we consider them from a human point of view. The challenge for us who have ears to hear is to listen to the message of this parable and take it to heart. First, it is the nature of the sower to sow to cast seed extravagantly, widely, and in every place the sower can reach. The grace and love of God and the good news of that grace and love are priceless commodities, but that should not lead us to believe that they are in short supply. There is more than enough to go around, which is precisely why God sows these seeds in soil we would choose to ignore. And because God is so extravagant in sowing these seeds, so should each and every one of us be. Our concern should not be about worrying about success or failure. Our concern should be about sowing the good news plain and simple. Which leads us to the second lesson. We are not to get discouraged. Now I will grant that that is easier said than done. It's easy to believe that we are making absolutely no difference when all we see around us is resistance or opposition. It's easy to want to give up and give in. It's easy to ask, what difference could we ever make? Especially as a small church or as individual Christians. If we base our endeavors on the results, then it is easy to say that we have failed. But we must remember that the results do not depend on us. Again, to quote Paul, what is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. Which now leads us to a final lesson from this parable. Yes, there is opposition and resistance to the word of God in the world today, but in the end, nothing can stop the word of God from bearing abundant and miraculous fruit. Historians of Jesus' day say that a seven to tenfold harvest would have been considered average to great. But the talk in Jesus' parable is of a hundredfold and sixtyfold and thirtyfold. Think about that. The final word of this parable, the final scene of the picture, is not one of birds snatching away the seed that was sown on the path, not the rootless plants on the rocky ground wilting in the blistering heat, not 
the spindly stalks crowded out by weeds, but of a full and bountiful harvest beyond anything humans could imagine. To the original disciples who were so few among so many, to Matthew's community dwarfed by its surroundings, that final scene engenders confidence and hope in God's ultimate purpose. Though the numbers are small, though the opposition is painful, though the rejections are many, the remarkable size of the harvest is a reminder of God's blessing and the assurance of a grand and glorious conclusion according to God's will and God's design. In other words, God's farming methods may seem quite foolish to us, but in the end, God will smile and say to us, who's foolish now? To God be all the honor, glory, and praise forever. Amen.